are happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs forever new. I said that these odes have commonalities in structural properties, in ideas and in language. And it is with reference to one of these commonalities that I've brought in this quotation from Ode on a Grecian Urn. Bidding farewell to the nightingale, Keats uses the word adieu. And more significantly, he uses the word adieu thrice, uh, three times at that point of the poem. In the play Hamlet, adieu is the word with which the ghost bids farewell, taking leave of Hamlet having informed him of the murder plot. Hamlet himself is an important model for Keats. Hamlet, who has the vocation that he must avenge his father, but who allows so much time to pass in indecision and perhaps madness. Keats is likewise plagued by the sense that he can't or won't answer his vocation. This had become acutely problematic in 1819. Coleridge claimed, I have a smack of Hamlet about me myself. Hamlet is a romantic paradigm for duties neglected, genius wasted, indulgence in melancholy and indecision. As I said, Keats saw his main business as a poet as narrative verse, big long poems that told stories and more significantly, which sold in vast numbers. So the accomplishment of an ode, a shorter, more personal poem, is always haunted by a sense that his true work goes unwritten. The word adieu occurs elsewhere in the 1819 odes. In the Ode on Indolence, Keats addresses three figures, love, ambition, and my demon poesy, finding that none of them can stir him out of a Hamlet-like inaction, and therefore he dismisses them. So ye three ghosts adieu, ye cannot raise my head cool bedded in the flowery grass. In the Ode on Melancholy, Keats refers to joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu. The Ode to Psyche looks forward to a moment of the lovers in stasis on Ode on a Grecian Urn and uses the same allusion to Shakespeare again to associate the satisfaction of desires with death. Here Keats describes a vision of the mythical lovers Psyche and Cupid. Their lips touched not, but had not bade adieu. To understand Keats's odes, explore these commonalities, find things that they share and consider their significance. Also, with each individual ode, as I've done with Ode to a Nightingale, follow its structure, follow its trajectory, to see where it goes, what mental journey it takes, and what the poet has realised by the conclusion.